You're watching Capital Connection from the Illinois State Capitol. Last week, we told you that House Speaker Michael Madigan intends to move forward to uh, instruct the Office of the Architect here on the Capitol grounds to remove the statue of U.S. Senator Stephen Douglas from the front steps just outside the Capitol. It stands about 50, 75 yards behind the statue of Abraham Lincoln. Those two men, of course, were political rivals back in their day. We wanted to understand a little bit more about the history of who Stephen Douglas was. Speaker Madigan said that that statue is a symbol of hate and cited uh, his wife's and his ownership of a plantation in Mississippi, along with his disparaging remarks about people of color from years ago as two of his primary reasons why he wants to see that statue come down. Joining us now is a Lincoln Studies professor from the University of Illinois Springfield, Professor Graham Peck, actually the Wepner Distinguished Professor of Lincoln Studies at the university there. Uh, professor, it's good to have you with us. Thank you, thank you for having me. I understand you focus your specialty uh, is on the Civil War era and Reconstruction and all of that time leading up to, of course, Stephen Douglas died in 1861, so he wasn't really around for all of that. But uh, you're, I'm sure you're still generally familiar with the politics of that era and of, of who he was generally. Do you have any idea why that statue was ever put up in the first place? I don't know exactly the history behind that statue, although it would not be difficult to do research in the contemporary newspapers to find out why it was put up at the time. But what I can tell you is what Douglas did that would have caused people to put up a statue uh, for him at the Capitol grounds. He did three really important things for the, the history of the state and the nation uh, that, are, that are notable. One is that he was the founder of the state Democratic Party, the, the party that Michael Madigan effectively now leads. And he did that as, uh, as part of the Jacksonian era movement for democracy. So he was one of the great Democrats at his time. Uh, not only in terms of founding the Democratic Party, but small d Democrat. He believed in the power of the people, and he was against the power of elites to control the government and to create create inequality in society. So that was one of his founding. He believed in the power of some people, didn't he? That's correct. Although uh, at the time, you must remember, uh, you know, the the movement for equality was predominantly in the Jacksonian era, a movement away from elite white men towards a broader uh, array of white men who didn't have property. Uh, although absolutely it is true, the Democratic Party itself, not just Douglas, was well known for being focused on the rights of white men to a degree that was greater even than that of the Whig Party, its, its rival. And the you know, not even the Whigs, though, really believed that women should vote. Very few were advocating for the right of blacks to vote. In Illinois, overwhelmingly, there were very, very harsh black laws. They were extremely punitive to black people. They had a lot of public support, not universal public support, but a very uh, large degree of support. So it wasn't as if Douglas and the Democratic Party were somehow completely atypical in this regard. Mm -hmm. So that was one uh, of his big contributions. The other two, very quickly, he, he uh, outshone three presidents during his uh, time as a US Senator. You know, for about uh, 12, 13, 14 years, he was a senator. And that's really quite extraordinary. I consider him the most important U.S. senator in the history of the United States, which is, which is quite an achievement. He was the primary broker of a compromise in 1850 that preserved peace, that prevented the Civil War in 1850, thus outshining the president of that time. Then four years later, he was the author of one of the uh, most extraordinary measures in the history of Congress, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which ironically undid what the Compromise of 1850 did, and it threw the country into a massive political conflagration that would result ultimately in civil war. And in pushing for that measure, he outshone the president uh, uh, of that period, which is Franklin Pierce. And then three years later, in the Lecompton Constitution controversy, he threw his weight against passage of a pro-slavery Lecompton Constitution thus defeating the objectives of President James Buchanan, again, outshining a president. So his, he, and so he won on all, each of those occasions. He got his will through Congress uh, and three epic congressional battles. But then he ended up losing his races for president. And uh, of course, there, I don't know if you'd say he lost the Lincoln, uh, the, the Lincoln Douglas debates because that was about another Senate race, but uh, ultimately, I've, I've read some historians say that without Douglas, there would be no Lincoln. One, do you agree with that statement? And two, uh, more broadly, why, why, why do you 
think that statement is so prevalent? Uh, was there something about Douglas himself that helped to catapult Lincoln to national popularity? Absolutely. That statement is true. And it's, it's actually almost a truism among historians. It's not really debated. The reason is, is because of what I just mentioned. Stephen Douglas was the greatest, most, in my view, the most important politician of the entire 1850s, which is very rare for a senator to have that stature. His name was known throughout the country. He was known even internationally, as Lincoln himself complained privately, that they had both emerged as rivals in the 1830s. Lincoln had been a chief founder of the Whig Party, Douglas of the Democratic Party, that the Democratic Party dominated the state. D Douglas used it you know, to, to, to elevate himself into, into national politics, into enormous renown. And Lincoln was mired in Springfield in a party that only had power in central Illinois. The most he could do really was elect a person to Congress, which Lincoln accomplished for two years. So Douglas was enormously significant. And not only was he, is he powerful and significant, but he was at the cutting edge of the change of the 1850s. So what ends up happening is that Lincoln is opposed to the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854. And he because doesn't it open the door? I want to I want to zero in on the reason there for just a quick moment, if you don't mind. Wasn't that because he feared it would open the door for slavery to creep in to those Midwestern or back then just Western states? It did indeed. The, 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 the legislation did precisely that. Now, Douglas probably did not expect that to happen. He probably expected freedom to triumph. Well, he argued that those states should be able to decide that for themselves. That's correct. And so... Which means he was at least open to it, wasn't he? He was open to the expansion of slavery? He was absolutely, as part, you must understand, as part of a broader solution to the problem of slavery in American politics, slavery had been uh, creating repeated massive conflagrations in American politics since the Missouri Compromise. Everyone understood by the 1850s it was a serious problem. In 1850, the nation had almost come apart. And Douglas, though, was not a cautious man, and he wanted, he was a passionate nationalist. He wanted the country to expand. The problem was, every time he tried to expand the country, Southerners wanted to expand slavery, and Northerners generally didn't want to expand slavery, although there was division in the North on that point. The Democratic Party was more tolerant of slavery than the Whig Party, without any question. And so Douglas's popular sovereignty concept, which was, as you mentioned, uh, permitted the territorial settlers to decide whether slavery would be legal in a territory. That was his idea for resolving the problem of territorial expansion, that, that you know, we can acquire territory and permit the settlers to decide. He thought the settlers would predominantly decide in favor of freedom, therefore freedom would predominate. In the long term, he thought very likely that this would allow freedom to predominate in the nation, not just in the territories, because northerners would gain more political power slavery would eventually die out. He says this or, in Or put another way, yeah, or I guess put another way, if our country can expand westward and the cost is that some of those states or some of those citizens might still enslave people, then okay, so be it. Yes, although to be fair, he expected that to be a small portion of the states where most states were going to end up being free. And we know that because he says this in 1850, in an earlier debate with a super pro-slavery Senator John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. So that's our insight into how he thought popular sovereignty would operate. The problem was, it was a very big problem, that the anti-slavery provisions of the Missouri Compromise had promised uh, you know, the remaining territories north of 36, 30 degrees and all the way west of the Rocky Mountains, an enormous uh, territory, almost all of it acquired from, you know, in the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, that territory was guaranteed to freedom by congressional law under the Missouri Compromise anti-slavery provisions. And to get the popular sovereignty law passed, Douglas had to overturn the Missouri Compromise anti-slavery provisions. And so that enraged the North. It's, it's, it's impossible to understate the degree of rage it was extraordinary. He was hung up in effigy. His effigy was burned many times. So that's, that's one of the reasons why Douglas preceded Lincoln and created the platform for Lincoln to trounce him on. There you go. But it, it takes a while for Lincoln to trounce him. But starting in 1854, Lincoln decides to follow him around the central portions of the state. This was not the 1858 debates. This was in 1854. And Lincoln develops his great, what's called the Peoria Address, this extraordinary anti-slavery speech 
still to this day my favorite Lincoln speech. And it's, it's Lincoln's emergence as a profoundly significant anti-slavery leader. And he will end up being the prime player building the Republican Party in Illinois. And by 1860, having successfully done that, having built this party in Illinois, he would end up uh, being selected in the Chicago Convention, the Republican uh, National uh, Party Convention, which was held in, in Chicago. He was selected as the presidential nominee. And only at that moment did he finally supplant Douglas, who was also the presidential nominee, but was finally beaten by Lincoln. And Lincoln, of course, lost to him in the 1858 debates. Mm -hmm. I think that, so, so the other part of all this, you're mentioning that uh, Douglas's accomplishments and that Douglas, Douglas had this like compromise and he was this nationally renowned figure in all of this. I imagine a man of that much uh, ego might be insulted at the idea that Lincoln would come along and say, uh, these United States will either become all one thing or all the other, all slave or all free states at some point wasn't so much that he was insulted. Now that, that speech, the House Divided speech, was given by Lincoln at the beginning of the 1858 debates, uh, really before even the debates were, that it was known that they would happen. He gives that at the Republican, the Illinois uh, State uh, Party a, a nominating convention, and he gives his speech, and it's, it's sort of setting the framework for his position on what needs to be done in the slavery question, because the Republicans want to create a national policy that will lead to what Lincoln calls the ultimate extinction of slavery. And so Lincoln says, look, it's either going to become fully legal everywhere and it's going to penetrate into the northern states or it's going to get abolished everywhere. Now, he doesn't say it's going to happen right away. He simply says that the nation is going to reach a crisis. And once the crisis has been reached, it will pass. He does not believe there will be a civil war. Douglas is going to be the one who says in response to the speech that, no, this will bring on a civil war. He proves to be correct about this. Douglas does not believe the Southerners will accept the destruction of slavery. Mm -hmm. and, and Lincoln and many of the Republicans did believe they would accept that. They didn't think that, that, that the Southerners would do anything so rash as to destroy the country and potentially imperil slavery, which of course was the consequence. Slavery was destroyed by the Civil War. It would have lasted for decades, maybe well over a century. It could have lasted for a very long time under the, Congress, uh, under the constitutional protections that it had prior to the Civil War. But Douglas realized that Southerners were, were very antagonistic to this doctrine. And so Douglas's position was that we need to preserve the Union. It wasn't so much he was insulted by Lincoln. He saw both for his, the maintenance of his own power, but also for the survival of the country that he treasured, that, that this Republican doctrine, in his view, was a dangerous doctrine. And so he fought it tooth and nail. That his, his view was basically that slavery was a sin that our country could live with. Uh, Douglas never called it a sin. In fact, Douglas was unique, Lincoln argued, in the entire nation for never saying that slavery was wrong or right. He refused to discuss its morality during the debates. He said, the reason I won't is because I have no legitimate basis to do so. I'm not a voter in the slave states. I'm not a politician in the slave states. And under the Constitution, slavery can only be maintained in the states. It's not maintained by the federal government. Was he trying to toe that line to placate Southern Democrats? Was that because the, I, I want to bring this back to the current conversation for just a moment, too, because Speaker Madigan said he was reading Sidney Blumenthal's book, All the Powers of, of the Earth. And in that book, it mentions that Douglas's first wife had a plantation. Her family owned a plantation uh, that had slaves in Mississippi. And it sort of alludes to the fact that Douglas may have used that as some sort of access to Southern Democrats to sort of elbow up to them and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm basically one of you. Though he lived in Illinois and did not live on that plantation, he owned it, apparently profited from it. Uh, one, ha have you seen anything in your studies that confirms that? The reason I ask is because the speaker asked his staff to go look into and fact check that claim. And, and two, does that jive with your understanding of Douglas, that he wanted to sort of appease Southern Democrats or associate with them to some degree to elevate uh, his, his own political stature? Yes, those are two separate questions. Let me answer them both. So first of all, the issue of Douglas and slavery is fairly well known among historians. It's not that more research couldn't be done, but I can answer your questions as is. So, so Douglas married a daughter of a wealthy slave owner in the late 1840s. 
the, the slave owner offered to Douglas to, to give him uh, plantation and slaves, which was not uncon uh, uncommon. Remember under coverture, which was the law of the time, any assets a woman had in marriage immediately went to the husband because he covered her. That word literally meant he covered her legal person. So both children and the wife were folded under the husband's legal persona. And so all of her property, unless there was some special legal provision for marriage, all went to the husband. Interestingly enough, Douglas refused that offer. He said, I do not want to hold that property. Now, why he said that, we can't be certain. Was it that he was opposed morally to having slavery? It's possible. Was it, was it that he didn't want to be uh, uh, opened up politically to, to criticism that he's a northerner who owns slaves? Also possible. Uh, what we do so know, was Blumenthal's book wrong? Uh, no, no, it's not wrong uh, in this regard. Let me just be more specific. So what happens is the, the, the slave owner in his will gives a substantial plantation and slave property to Douglas's wife. So she did own the property and he ended up managing it from which he took income. He derived income. There were different agreements. One agreement gave him 20% and the later agreement gave him 30% of the profits of those plantations, if I'm remembering the sequence of those agreements correctly. So he unquestionably used that money for his political campaigns. He made money in a lot of other ways. He was, he was primarily like a real estate speculator. He was, you know, a lot of government officials at that time did all sorts of real estate speculation. And, and, and they were able to make a lot of money because it was essentially a form of insider trading. They would pass laws that would make their land much more valuable. And that was not illegal at the time. So, so he had other ways that he had made money, but, but certainly he benefited from slavery. You could call it direct or indirect, both would be accurate, uh, to a much greater degree than most Northern politicians would have. Now, that all being true, uh, it's also the case that it's not as if he was using this to cozy up to Southern Democrats. I think that's a mistake. He'd had very strong connections to Southern Democrats ever since he came into Congress in the mid 1840s, and, what, and, and was an avowed nationalist and expansionist. And there were a number of other Southern Democrats who were big supporters of that. And not every issue was a sectional issue. There were many issues that were party issues. So Douglas, by, by definition, as a Democrat, had strong allegiances to other Democrats, whether in the South or the North. Mm -hmm. And clearly, he, had pre, he, he was not antagonistic to Southerners. There's no question about that. His record on votes on slavery uh, were tended to be pretty favorable to the South, even compared to most Northern Democrats. That, that is no question. So, so he had long since, you might say, to the extent we want to use the language cozied up to the South, he had done that a long time earlier. And in fact, in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he's breaking from the South. He'd already broken from them sharply in, uh, it, with the Lecompton Constitution because he had fought that tooth and nail and defeated it by voting with the Republicans who provided most of the votes. Southerners were enraged that, that he defeated the pro-slavery with Compton Constitution. And then only months later in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, what does he do but to say uh, the Supreme Court decision in Dred Scott can essentially be nullified if territorial settlers ignore it and refuse to enforce the law by refusing to provide protections for slavery that the Dred Scott decision said that slaveholders constitutionally uh, were justified in having. So okay, so that, that brings me to like, that, that brings me, I, all this is fascinating. I, I'm loving this conversation, I have to say, but it, it all brings me to two key questions. And I, I wanna ask them one at a time. The first one is that this, you've written, I think about this extensively, was Douglas pro-slavery or anti-slavery as a policy, but there's no question he was overtly racist, right? I mean, he said in, in the first debate, the Lincoln-Douglas debate, I went back and read through some of those. I just wanted to get a better bearing on what exactly it was he believed. And he said this, trying to scare white people in Illinois in a free state. He asked them, quote, do you desire to turn this beautiful state into a free Negro colony in order that when Missouri abolishes slavery, she can send 100,000 emancipated slaves to Illinois to become citizens and voters on an equality with yourselves. He's scaring them by the fright th that, that 100,000 black people would come to Illinois and live here and vote and be on an equal playing field with them. That's overtly racist, is it not? Oh, there's no question. I, I write in the article you mentioned that Stephen A. Douglas was both the 
political head of the anti-anti-slavery movement. I don't say the pro-slavery movement because he wasn't advocating pro-slavery pro like Southerners were. And he, in fact, disputed, as I mentioned, with John C. Calhoun, the idea that should be a pro-slavery nation. But he, he was the political and, I argue, the ideological head of the anti-anti-slavery movement. So he fights the anti-slavery people as well because he's afraid they're going to destroy the union. So he's sort of caught up in trying to please everyone with some sort of policy that might thread the needle of, of the day. Yes, he's afraid the country is going to crack up and he was not wrong about this. We have to give him some credit. He, what he saw actually occurred, a horrendous carnage, a massive bloodbath, the scale of which if we had it today would be many, many, many millions of Americans who would die fighting each other. So he saw it and he sought to avoid it. Now, uh, the way he did that, of course, with race is particularly uh, unappealing when you read it today, because the racism already in the 19th century, by our standards, was extreme. So we, even if you look at some of Lincoln's statements, the worst of his statements, we would, we would unquestionably say are racist, although there were very few of them relative to what he said throughout his career, and moreover, he was an extraordinary epistle, uh, apostle for equality. And he wrote many epistles uh, to Americans throughout his career, arguing for equality and contesting a black inferiority as best he could as a leading politician of a major party. In other words, it was very difficult for him to speak as an abolitionist. Abolitionists were by far and away the most egalitarian of Americans. Uh, what we would say to say the far left of the political spectrum. Uh, and Douglas is, you know, over several notches to the right and to the very far right would be your pro-slavery advocate saying slavery is a great thing, which Douglas doesn't say that. So, so what Douglas does do, what Douglas does do to carve out space for his position is to hone in on the racial issue and to tell white Northerners that, look, your liberties are at stake with slavery as well, because right now if they're enslaved, they can't leave the South if they ever become free, which is the Republican Party doctrine, because Lincoln is telling us he wants ultimate extinction. He tells us that, and he quotes the Declaration of Independence repeatedly to tell us, he says, that, that Black people have rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he says, how can Lincoln tell us that, and how can the Republicans tell us that, and, and, and yet also say Black people will not one day have social and political equality with us? And, and in fact, this was, a, this was a very serious threat the Republicans backed away from their position as a party and Lincoln's position was that there was a distinction between pol political and social equality and the rights enumerated in the Declaration of Independence. And they said the founders articulated those natural rights which come from God and those rights are distinct from social and political rights that are granted by government. And we are not advocating, they made themselves very clear, complete equality for black people. They backed away from that very strongly and, and they do not end up succeeding in removing these, these very severe black laws, as they were called, until the middle of the Civil War. Now, granted, the Republican Party did do that eventually, but again, that's, that was hard to do. It was not easy in the state uh, yeah. because an overwhelming preponderance of voters, and we know this because they voted on these black law provisions in the 1850s, an overwhelming preponderance supported these incredibly harsh uh, d d discriminatory laws. A war, a war changes. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh sorry. To, uh, a, a war changes a people. It demands of them to reflect and to sacrifice. And certainly, that was a turning point uh, in our nation's history, uh, undoubtedly. Um, I hate to cut you off there, but I, w I wanted to ask you this this last question. Uh, the, the second question I have is: Do th this sort of current cultural discussion that we're having in our country, in our politics right now, do we need? Do we require a statue to stand in a place of public prominence to learn from that person's history, or can we learn from that history without that statue being there? Well, I think the question is easily answered. If you destroy a statue, what you're destroying is the historical landscape. You are not destroying the history. Those things often get confused. We should be very clear about the distinction. So the history of Stephen A. Douglas is not going to change if the statue is taken down. There will be a difference in how visible he is. 
And I, and I would never say that no statues should come down. I, I, and I think many historians have not the slightest objection to Confederate statues coming down for the very simple reason that the Confederates were trying to destroy the country openly. And then and they're not just the country's physical structure, but its ideas. They attacked the Declaration of Independence that Lincoln was desperately trying to defend and has been the basis for our country's fitful movements towards equality over time. And, and we definitely have moved in that direction beyond any question, in my view. There's just no but, doubt about but that. Just for, but just, just for sake of argument, didn't Stephen A. Douglas argue against those promises that are enshrined in our founding documents uh, that were all created equal? Didn't he actively argue against that? He did, and Lincoln was very opposed to that. It's also true that Douglas fought passionately against secession. He, he at, at, at some risk to his physical safety, was the first presidential candidate to tour the South. He toured the South after it became clear that Lincoln was going to win because they had these elections that preceded the big election that would tell you how, the, how states were going to vote. And in those state elections, it became clear Lincoln was going to win. So Douglas tours the South to keep the South in the Union. And he tells them, if you leave the Union, I will use all of my power to crush you out. He can't do it. The constitutional election of Abraham Lincoln to the presidency is no justification for destroying this Union. That's virtually his exact words. And, and he could have been assaulted there. That was dangerous to say. He says it, though, repeatedly in front of Southern public audiences. Then when Lincoln's elected and the South leaves the Union, he goes to Lincoln and he says, what do I need to do? How can I help? Lincoln says, go, give speeches, keep Northern Democrats in the Union. We need them. And indeed, there were many uh, Northern Democrats, especially in the lower Ohio River Valley, in states like Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, had Southern heritage. They were toler highly tolerant of slavery. They, were not, they had brothers and sisters who were in states like Kentucky and Tennessee. They mm -hmm. easily could not have supported the Union. Douglas tells all of them, you must fight for this country. We must preserve this country. And he gives an incredibly famous speech, one of the greatest of his career, called the Protest the Flag speech at the old state capitol. It's a great speech, and he just, it's a, I won't even try and give it to you, but it's worth looking up. You can find it online. And, and then, he, then he exhausts himself by doing this. He dies in Chicago, overcome by, by exhaustion and stress and a lot of drinking and smoking, too. Uh, and Illinois and, politicians always have had their vices. Yes, and so, and so he was an he was enormous patriot. At the same time, he was one of the greatest race baiters in all of American history. And yes, he was willing to sacrifice black people for white liberty. No question, that is true. Um, you know, because that was a trait for him. He wanted to keep the country and he loved liberty. It wasn't that he didn't love liberty. He just was willing to extrude black people from it. And, and that's, a, that's a very hard uh, kind of historical truth, but it is a truth. And so I think what's done with um, the statues is up to the state legislature. You know, I, I think we shouldn't fight too much as a country about symbolic things. You know, the country's history is not going to disappear if it's taken down. On the other hand, Douglas is not going to jump off from the statue and give racist speeches anymore. It's a statue. It's cement and, and, and iron. And if we take them down, it's not going to hurt anyone or specifically help anyone. I think we should be clear on that. Any improvements that we make, we need to make. Just like people in the Civil War era change their society and their law to improve their society. Uh, call, a call for civic engagement there. I hear, uh, I hear a call from you saying let's rewrite and let's make our own history more than rewrite our, our actual history. I, I think that if we really want to change something moving forward, even, even though I think it matters to understand our history profoundly, I've given my life to doing that. Nevertheless, if, I've never got anything done in my life by looking at the past, I got things done by doing something in the present. That's true of every single human being. And I think as a society, that's a really, that's a really important idea to have at the forefront. And, and also, I guess I would add one thing. We need to be careful about what statues we destroy because the context for all of them is different. And um, there's, for example, there's this uh, famous statue in Washington that people are thinking of taking down. It's of Lincoln and of a kneeling slave. I can't tell you how opposed I would be to taking down that statue. It was funded by $20,000 from free, primarily from freed slaves and entirely from African Americans. They paid for it, it like the first piece of massive public art by, by African American slaves in the country's history. And that was worth about, in mean, today's dollars, about a half million dollars. An incredible speech was given by Frederick Douglass, one of the greatest of Americans in American history, hands down in my views, right up there with Lincoln, an extraordinary figure. He gives an amazingly important speech. 
And the idea that we would take down that statue, saying it's a racist statue when it's put up by African Americans who are finding a way into the country that they'd always been kept out of and were honoring Lincoln because they realized that prior to Lincoln, there had been a huge number of pro-slavery presidents, not every one of them, but most of them. And there's no way there would have been emancipation with any of those prior presidents, that Lincoln was someone truly who changed their lives and the, and the arc of their descendants' lives. So that's an important kind of context that I don't think is well known, mm -hmm. certainly for that statue. And, and that's true to a lesser or greater degree for all public art. So I think it behooves us also to try and consult with historians uh, in a, as a general principle before making these decisions. And in my case, for instance, uh, I'm hoping that my film on Douglas, I actually made an hour long film that was shown on WTTW Channel 11 Chicago in 2016. I've just tried to load it on Amazon Prime so everyone can watch it for free who has Prime. It's an hour long feature film that will tell you very balanced look at Stephen A. Douglas. And I actually made it for the tomb. I made it for the state historic site there, really to explain why there was this enormous statue of Stephen A. Douglas sitting in the middle of Chicago in what's now Bronzeville, you know, a very famous yeah. African-American area in Chicago. And there are calls to tear that down too. Yeah, well, he is buried there. I mean, I really think that's the sort of kind of critical information that I think we need to think about. Do we really want to be going to cemetery areas? Personally, for me, uh, even for the Confederates, I don't go into cemeteries and start destroying statues, um, yeah. you, know, you know, of people of right over their grave. I, I don't think we should do that. Um, I think people have passed on, they're buried, we should leave them is my view there. Uh, whatever you do with every other Douglas statue, I would leave that one there where he's buried underneath it. Well, our audience uh, has been enriched with a college education here today, a fascinating conversation. Uh, for more on this, you can go to our website where the full discussion uh, will be there. But Professor Graham Peck from the U University of Illinois Springfield, the distinguished professor of the Wetner Lincoln Studies there, uh, man, so much. I'm sure we could keep discussing this for a long time, but thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, we're back in just a moment.